This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. The subject is the Uncanny Valley. I have two experts on that, and the conversation will begin in a moment. The subject is the Uncanny Valley. I have Philippe Rochard, is it? Yes. And Shen Sheng Wang uh, to speak about it. Uh, I'd like to give you both a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. So, Philippe, if you want to just tell a little bit about who you are and, and your interest in uh, the subject. Yeah. Uh, I am a developmental psychologist. I'm teaching here at Emory for the past uh, 28 years at the psychology department. Uh, I, I grew up in Geneva, I, in Switzerland. I did my PhD in the school of Jean Piaget. Uh, I had him as a professor in the last year he taught. So I've been greatly influenced by his uh, perspective, the legal perspective. And I came to the States to study babies uh, during the big uh, baby revolution, revealing that uh, uh, babies were not as passive and incompetent as we thought. And I came here and I, I, I'm doing research on uh, uh, early social cognitive development, and I'm particularly interested in um, social cognition, it's an emergence in human ontogeny, and uh, I, I have a particular focus on the emergence of self-consciousness and um, uh, the, the, the feeling of being evaluated by others, how it emerges in Gothic, as I see as a, a particular feature of um, humans, uh, human psychology, uh, humans are reputable individuals, and uh, I'm interested in, in that origin. My interest in the Uncanny Valley was really uh, fostered by discussion with uh, Chen Chang, who is uh, a graduate student, doctoral student, uh, here at my lab. And uh, in, in, in relation to the perception and detection of animacy in faces, in face perception. And that's how we, we, we did uh, some studies on that and uh, wrote a review paper on the various theories on the, the phenomenon. But this is kind of a side project for me. Uh -huh. So you know. So when you say a uh, specialist of the uncanny value, it's a little bit uh, uh, forceful. Okay, well, uh, uh, Shen Sheng, if you could uh, give a little background on yourself as well. Cool. Hi, I'm Shen Sheng Wang. I'm from Tianjin, China. Um, I came to Dr. Rochelle's lab at Emory University in 2012 as a grad student. Now I'm a six year grad student. I'm doing my PhD dissertation now. So um, I came to know the Uncanny Valley through Dr. Rochelle. Um, um, I'm pretty interested in this because I think it's uh, interesting and it also have uh, important implications for human robot uh, interactions. Okay. And it's also important for us to understand human. Um, well, let me uh, uh, start with the obvious and uh, have uh, either one of you uh, define what the uncanny valley is because uh, we are talking about it because we know of it. But for someone who may just stumble on this video in a few years and just watch it, uh, could you give a definition of who came up with the idea and what it refers to? So the uncanny valley hypothesis originated in Japan. Uh, it was proposed by a Japanese uh, roboticist called Masahiro Mori. So he came up with this idea that as robots become increasingly human-like, they tend to like him more. At a certain point, when it become too human-like, but not quite, they start to feel repulsive and even eerie. Yeah. So that's how um, this uncanny valley um, uh, idea come up. And uh, the original paper was in Japanese. So uh, an American researcher and his uh, Japanese collaborator translated uh, this paper, which was published in 2007, uh, no, in 1970. They translated this paper into English in 2005. If I remember correctly, yeah. So when we came out. so just for the layperson, when we talk about the uncanny valley, we're talking about uh, your typical human beings 
unease between being comfortable with the science fiction version film of the clanky ro metallic robot, you know, yeah, you know, yes, sir, yes, yes, what from the 1950s sci-fi films, and people who look definitively human. There's that dip in unease that comes between something that looks a bit human, has some robotic characters, but we can say, well, that's not really a person, correct? Correct. So when, when the, the androids become close to the human life, there's a certain dip in the uh, likability yeah. of, uh, of, of, of you know, this, uh, this creature. So what is interesting is that you have, I mean, according to the hypothesis, now the question is whether it's real or not. I mean, this is a huge debate in the literature. Uh, but there's this inter interesting increase as the robot looks like humans, mm -hmm. there's an increase in likability. And when it comes too close to be like a human, there's a sudden dip and a mm -hmm. feeling of eeriness, uncanniness, mm -hmm. and, uh, this drop and then uh, recovery of uh, likability uh, when they've been very close or being perceived as human, uh, characterize this dip, this valley. This and, is the uncanny valley. And do we have the uncanny valley in things other than physical characteristics, i.e., if we hear the typical robotic voice, yes, I am, sir, I will serve you kind of robotic voice, but we hear of human speaking naturally, do people have that kind of d unease about robotic voices as they do about the look? So, uh, as far as we know, but Chen Chen can confirm, uh, the uncanny valley has, un has not been really studied or replicated in the auditory modality. Mm. Uh, there's been some uncanny nets created by the mismatch between the voice and face. Yeah. Okay? So if you have a synthesized voice and a real face, it can create this uncanny feeling. Mm. But uh, I presume that, uh, I, I think personally, that uh, you might be able to find it also with only voices. Mm. But you find the uncanny valley uh, phenomenon is reported not only with faces, but also with other parts of the body. Uh, I can't so it's more physical. For example, if people listen to someone like Stephen Hawking's metallic voice when he lost the ability to speak, some people find that weird or people who have had you know, throat cancer and they hold the little thing up to their voice. Uh, people are not generally thought to be as much at unease as they are with something that looks a little different. Well, it's, it hasn't been yet established. Yes, yeah. okay. Uh, this is something that would be interesting to study. I, I suppose here in Atlanta, we used to have in the subway at the huge airport mm -hmm. uh, a synth uh, synthesized voice that would announce the, the various stuff. And when I first came to Atlanta, I felt I felt really uncanny feelings in relation to this voice. So I, pre I presume that it must exist mm -hmm. also. But that hasn't been done also. I saw that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think the, the key. Um, point of debate is how we define the uncanny feeling. Uh -huh. So currently we know about the uncanny feeling through the uncanny valley hypothesis and through uh, a number of examples like uh, computer generated images in computer games, in uh, films um, that create uh, human replica that look extremely human like, that tend to elicit some unease. But the question is, do they really uh, can be called uh, uncanny feelings? That's the question. Uh, um, so for those people who are, are more lay people, this whole idea though of making uh, of the uncanny valley is important because as we presumably get closer to making more lifelike robots slash androids and they become integrated into our society in 50, 100 years, we don't want people, you know, if, if we're making robotic uh, nannies to handle our babies when we go to work, we don't want to be put at dis-ease with them. If we, let's face it, if we make sex bots, we don't want to have, you know, uh, 
uh, we want someone that looks like a real supermodel, if, you know, if you're heterosexual male, versus, you know, some creepy robot whose eyes are going to go like a cartoon, you know? So uh, this is important for the ideas of AI and embodiment, too. This is all connected, right? So, so the, the way I see it is that there, there are uh, two lines of interest uh, in relation to the phenomenon. One is uh, marketing, robotics, technological, things that you allude to. You know, how can we produce the most uh, attractive or sellable or livable uh, um, surrogate human, like machine life? Uh. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that it can, the, of the uncanny valley, it, it can be used, and it, this is really what we are interested in, is trying to understand what, what's in the face, okay? What's in the individual? How do we detect that someone is alive or dead? Uh. Uh, these are perennial questions of trying to define what makes uh, someone animate as opposed to inanimate, mm. and how do we detect that? And all the psychology that is linked uh, to, to, to this issue of animacy, perception, uh, detection, and eventually understanding and control. So these are two lines. Okay. There, is, there are some overlaps, of course, but I think that in the literature you see these two uh, directions, two views on the phenomenon, which is quite interesting to me, I think. Well, one of the things, and one of the reasons I wanted to do this show was not just to talk about the concept of the uncanny valley as it relates to robotics, but also uh, sort of antecedents, things that may uh, be precursors to what we would call this unease. And you brought up, you said the word animate, and I wanted to talk about cartoons. When I was a boy growing up watching Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse, they were hand drawn by human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, Whereas now we have CGI and Pixar, and when you look at the, these Pixar characters, they give the shading and they have more three-dimensionality than Bugs Bunny did, but you look at the faces and they have that thing when I've looked online for you know demonstrations of Uncanny Valley, Shrek or these other things, they're clearly not, even if they're, they're supposed to be human characters, they clearly are not humanoid, and their emotional expressiveness is not as much as, say, hand-drawn uh, human characters during the golden age of cartoons. And I'm wondering if th it's the fact that we're using computers to make these animate CGI characters versus artists that used to draw them. Yeah, uh, I, this is like a personal impression on, uh, on this. I, I'm fascinated by that. Uh, uh, for me, this cartoon Pixar, uh, for personally, they are creepy. Okay? Yeah. So I do feel, yeah, okay, is it because, you know, I grew up also watching old Walt Disney and, and Bugs Bunny yeah. and Popeye, and uh, that there was this artistry, this, the trace of the artist that was uh, in, in, in the pictures, and that made it animated. So the animation was both the yeah. character that you saw, but also how it was made. I mean, there, there was always a reminder, you had uh, uh, the, the traces uh, of the make, you had the craft behind. Right. And I think it was a dual appreciation of the craft and of the product of the craft. Yeah. Now, uh, so I think that's part of the, uh, well, I think we feel that uh, although not as perfect visually, uh, this old cartoon work, they, they contain maybe more animacy in the sense that more human-like traces uh, in, in the making. This is an interesting question. But I think the uncanniness with Pixar, some people like myself, and I know that other people feel very uncanny because I would never go see this movie. It, it, it's interesting. How about Shenzhen, since you're obviously younger and you probably grew up more with some of these Pixar? Are you more comfortable than Philippe? Actually, I grew up watching Popeye. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, but no, what, what, do you, nice what do you feel when you watch these Pixar CGI cartoons? Yeah, they freak me out as well. Oh, really? I think part of the reason is that uh, the old school cartoons, they really have hand drawing. They're pretty yeah. simple. Yeah. And um, they don't have those details, but they really like uh, caricature. They really mm -hmm. exam uh, 
exaggerate certain facial features like uh, the facial features of baby or juvenile uh, animals. So they have big head, they have shorter limbs, which tend to elicit uh, black ability in all humans. I think that's part of the reason why they don't, they don't really make us repulsive. And actually, if you uh, know the evolution of Mickey Mouse, the Mickey Mouse originally started to be pretty a uh, mouse looking yeah. cat. Over the years, they started to make it more baby looking. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason that um, the artists want to make it more likable yeah. and to try to avoid the so called uncanny value. And it's, it's interesting too. That's why Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny wear white gloves is that you could see their hands more and you could see the more human-like digits that they would have. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask this though. Um, uh, with with the CGI, I've often found, and maybe Philippe and, and, and you have too, Shen Shen, is that if a character smiles in a, a Bugs Bunny cartoon or whatnot, it seems to be more indicative of joy smile. When I've seen these uh, mm -hmm. uh, CGI smiles, there's something sinister about them. And it's almost as if it's having the exact opposite effect as what's intended. And I'm wondering, where does that come from? Is, is that is that something that's a deficiency that you think in the ability of, of computer CGI technology to, to get human emotion? Or is it I mean, is it the, the machine or the human beings that don't know how to work them, you know? To be honest, uh, I haven't thought about this yeah. issue uh, carefully because it's a deep question. Yeah. But uh, in my impression, um, I think part of the reason why we don't have a smile on a less human-looking character like uh, Mickey Mouse, it is, again, it's a sign, it's a symbol uh -huh. that we can pick up quickly. Whereas when you really see a hyper-realistic character like a Shrek, you automatically perceive it as a person first. Mm -hmm. And that kind of smile is quite strange. Mm -hmm. And you cannot perceive or understand where that uh, emotion comes from. Yeah. I think that's part of the why that is, mm -hmm. I feel it is sin sinister. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you my take. I think that uh, uh, we, we have natural inclination, and one of those uh, is anthropomorphism, is to, to project things. And, and I think that uh, we need to have avenue to, to project and, uh, and engage in anthropomorphism. And uh, when things are too defined, it's somehow cut the flow of, uh, of our anthropomorphic uh, propensities and uh, create pr probably create some kind of a, a, a resistance that uh, uh, is linked to that. To that, I mean, the openness of the cartoon that the caricature to the, the openness to imagine to imagine what this character is, uh, I think, is a core. You know, yeah. For me, it's a core. And when it, things are too close, too defined, too dictated by the craft, I think that it it goes counter my propensities to project into it. It's, yeah, I, I want to just go off on a, a few tangents again of, of the things I've never heard associated with Uncanny Valley, and then we'll get back to the Uncanny Valley. Uh, first off, I, I, I was just thinking, and this just came to me, um, I've done a few shows on people who, you know, believe in things like uh, Bigfoots or uh, UFOs and whatnot. And if you're familiar with the UFO mythos of people being abducted and you look at these aliens that they see, these bug-eyed aliens with gray skin and whatnot, they look quite a bit like some of these CGI characters. They're vaguely humanoid, but they're different enough to cause unease that people claim that, you know, they come to them in the middle of the night and what are they demons or angels and whatnot? And I know this is not your expertise, but that would suggest to me that people are projecting their fears that, and maybe it comes from the same place as the uncanny valley. I, I don't know. And I don't, I, I, that is probably, you don't know what I'm talking about perhaps, but I, no, I don't no, no, I think, I think it's really interesting, but it, it, we're all speculating and yeah. talking about that. But I think that it's kind of revealing of, uh, of something. I mean, obviously these, uh, these creatures that are thought of, uh, 
they they represent the antithesis of what is natural to us. I mean, they are extra natural, right? So uh, they have this close feature that does not give much room and degrees of freedom for imagining what's happening inside their head. Mm. Right? I, I don't know. They, it, that, that's a little bit hard, I would, yeah. I, I would think. So, uh, you know. Shen Sheng, do you have any comment on that? I, I think those aliens freak me out as well. <laughs> That's simply how it looks. Yeah, because uh, there was a famous book 30 years ago called Communion, and the, 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 the visage of that supposed alien was one of the things that made it a bestseller for like half a year. Uh, I think it's more about uh, how we frame them. Yeah. So typically we frame the aliens as something mysterious, something fun, sci-fi, whereas we frame the uh, CGI or robots into our real-life situation something mm -hmm. that we want to interact with mm -hmm. and i think that's part of the reason why it makes a difference maybe uh -huh. yeah. although i haven't seen the movie honestly i've seen clips of it et which was a huge hit yeah but one possibility i mean you you've seen it i'm sure but uh that you it's kind of a deconstruction of the fear that associated with the alien and uh, yeah, there's this famous image of the fingers, that yeah. this contact, physical contact, that you are breaking walls, okay? And you, you're creating a humanity in this creature that at first was uh, pretty scary and eerie. Well, but it's interesting you bring that up because if you look at E.T. versus these gray mythic aliens, the gray mythic aliens, don't ha they're just black-eyed. They don't have any eyeballs. E.T., I believe, did have the whites of an eye. He had big eyes. He was small. He was cute. He had those fingers. He was sort of not, he was sort of like it, uh, the puppy version of these aliens that became Doberman Pinchers, you know? But there's some uh, interesting evolutionary evidence talking about the eyes, since yeah. you talk about the white of the eyes and the pupil and all yeah. that. That uh, there's evidence, if you compare like hundreds of different uh, primate species, uh, if, you, if you look at the contrast between the sclera, the white of the eyes, and, and the, the iris, uh -huh. uh, and uh, the, the greater the social group is, the more contrast there, there is between the sclera and, 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 and the iris. And actually, humans have the stronger contrast. Right? So if you put like you know, the planet of the apes, I always yeah. show this slide of whoever actor uh -huh. is under the hood of this ape, okay? Yeah. But human eyes, you know, it's a very strong, uncanny feeling. I mean, there's an inconsistency between what, what we feel is animal-like and the eyes that have this characteristic of the strong contrast. Oh, so you're talking like the... Like I'm assuming you're talking about the Charlton Heston original film series. Um, so like the 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 dark skinned black gorillas, for example, you could see the whites of their eyes very prominently that were played there. But real yeah. life gorillas, you're saying, don't have those whites. Yeah, uh, I can. Uh, the, the, there's very little uh, contrast mm. between the clear and the eyes, and uh, it, it's picked up by us. I mean, we. But this is how these these are proxies of uh, surface characteristic phenotypes. Mm -hmm that uh, we, we really pick up to enter the world of the uh, inference and mm -hmm. imagination of what's happening behind the surface characteristics. That's what I'm particularly interested in, Young Valley, is how do we break the surface characteristic of a face to start to enter into theories of mind and mm -hmm. how we build mind and theories about what's happening behind the the of the well, you, that's a nice segue into where I wanted to go next. Uh, unless Shen Shen, you wanted, did you want to comment on any of that? Uh, no. Okay. Well, my segue. I want to talk about two particular aspects that I would consider maybe possibly forerunners to this unease we feel with uh, uh, near human things. And the first one I want to talk about is a more current one, and that's androgyny. And I'm wondering if when we have these uh, sexual stereotypes of men and women, the macho V-shaped man, the figure eight female wearing the dresses and the man wearing whatever Western garb is being worn. And yet when we see someone like, say, Bruce Jenner, who is this great athlete, and now he's feminized and become 
uh, trying to become female, even though he still has broad shoulders. Or we see uh, a petite little woman who's very butch-like. I'm wondering if the the difference, the skew between our expectation of what a man should look like and what a woman should like and the people that present themselves slightly off, if, if that's also comes from the same place as the Uncanny Valley. I, I think the Uncanny Valley, I would prefer to define it more narrowly. Yeah. In the context of human-robot interaction. Okay. Uh, set up a very general categorical um, ambiguity uh -huh. issue. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether the gender ambiguity that caused some people to feel unease uh -huh. is exactly the same psychological construct as the uncanny feeling people talk about when they talk about human-like robots. Uh -huh. uh, but I guess your idea that there is a violation of people's expectation, that's uh -huh. there. Yeah. But the uncanny valley might involve um, more than that. That's my take. But, but uh, uh, what, the, what people call categorical uncertainty, uh, is a theory to try to explain the uh, uncanny valley phenomenon uh -huh. that is proposed in the literature uh, that you know we we cannot dispute. But I think there is something definitely about you know you can relate that to in social psychology to phenomena like cognitive dissonance. Uh, yeah. I, and 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 how. Uh, the fact that if you experience a mismatch or you witness a mismatch between what you, what you expect or what you yeah. what you know and what other people know, it's a source of stress, of tension. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is some kind of an analogy, there. Yeah. but whether it, it explains the uncanny valley uh, it, and and whether you can generalize that to androgyny, I mean, you know, this is questionable. Well, and there's an interesting finding okay. that uh, some Japanese researchers say they morph a, hum uh, a human face to an android to a robot face, and they want to see whether there's an uncanny valley uh, uh -huh. caused by uncatalogable uncertainty Dr. Oshad mentioned. Uh -huh. uh, and they, they show that the categorical uncertain um, faces tend to be uh, perceived as more uncanny. And they also morph a female face into a human face. And likewise, they, um, they show the effect. Uh, but this kind it's of finding, thing, mm -hmm. um, but this kind of finding is mixed. So mm -hmm. some studies, they show there's an effect, some they don't. So it's still debatable. But you understand so that you, you morph a, a, a female to a male, okay? yeah. and you have like different steps with uh -huh. a certain algorithm. And uh, you, you ask people to, uh, to decide you know, what, what is real, what, oh, what, what is woman, and what, what, what is male, what is female. Uh -huh. And uh, when it comes to a point where there is a, a certain uncertainty, it is linked to an eerie feeling mm. okay? and the transition or the threshold. Of the, of the transition between female and male. Well, I know Shen Cheng had said that he he defines uncanny valley more narrowly. Uh, um, so my second point after androgyny was to talk about uh, racial slash tribal slash ethnic differences, and I'm wondering if some of the the problems with the other. For example, I'm a white male, Philippe, you're a, a white male, and Shen Cheng is obviously from East Asia um, background. So if I'm if I'm part of, say, the same tribe as you, Philippe, and we, you know, and we're cave people, say, or we're, and we're living on one side of the river, and then we see Shen Cheng's tribe over there, and we're we'll say, well, he's kind of like us, but his nose doesn't stick out as far, and he's got those kind of little folds there, and his skin is a little darker. Does that perception of being like us, but not quite like us, do you think that's one of the basis of a lot of the prejudice, racism, etc. as well? I know Shen Cheng defines it more narrowly, but do you think it comes from the same place as we're seeing with the Uncanny Valley? I, I think uh, there is a difference between the Uncanny Valley uh -huh. And a more um, and another phenomenon that I'm interested in, which is dehumanization. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So I think what you are referring to is how people look, how their face look differently tend to uh, prompt people to uh, treat them differently. Yeah. So there has been studies that show that um, people tend to dehumanize um, all group members, and uh, they also perceive faces from an output, like from another race, to be less humanized. Yeah. So if I show you a morph that is created from me, my face, and a, a doll, doppelganger of my face, then you would probably adopt a higher threshold to say, this is a human. Right. But if you perceive your own race, you would adopt a lower threshold to say, this is enough for me to say this is a face. Right. So there has been some differences in this aspect. And you bring up the aspect of dehumanization. I think that's an important part here because if we are creating artificially intelligent robots, we are going to want them to do the manual labor and whatnot. But if, they're, if they are beings that have intelligence, they would de facto become another class of inhabitants on this planet. And we've always looked for sort of a slave class. But if we make them more human-like, we hopefully are going to be less likely to like the planet of the apes. You know, in the original Charlton Heston series, you know, the apes presumably became slaves after dogs died. And that's how the planet of the apes got started in that film series. So we don't, part of the reason I, I think a lot of social scientists are interested in this is that we don't create robots that are so different that we could easily say, well, they're just robots. You know, uh, am, am I onto something there? Uh, yeah, probably. I find I find it really interesting the way you you you, you frame it. But the, the fact of the matter, the 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 sense of what people call shared essence that you have with your in group, uh, and and the, if you have a shared a sense of a shared essence, you, I mean. You, you try to create contrast uh, with, with, with others, okay? So, uh, and, and it's, it's also uh, justifying a certain power uh, structure, as you said. I mean, you know, uh, whether you, 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 you share this, the same essence with you, you slave, typically you, you don't. I mean, you put certain limits. I mean, this is a very complex uh, master-slave relationship and how you project it to the but whether you well, traditionally, slaves were conquered peoples. You know, we weren't enslaving members of our own tribe, in, in essence. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, occasionally, we, maybe. We, we, we certain we, we certain boundaries, right? Yeah. Uh, the 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 maid uh, was was made made different, uh, wearing different outfit and uniform. Uh, so the 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 role where the, the role where definitely assigned differently. And, uh, so whether you know the shared essence, how deep are the shared essence? That's the problem, you know. How deep you, know, you connect with other, you know, what constitutes your in group and uh, what constitutes someone you consider a human as a lesser human or non-human. I mean, this is a, a perennial question, and I think that the uncanny valley tap into this question in an interesting way. Well, let me just get back to the Uncanny Valley then here. And uh, I know, Philippe, you said you might have to go. So if we can, I can just get maybe another 15 or 20 minutes here um, just to ask a few of these questions. Um, uh, I was just looking up on Wikipedia and uh, it listed about a dozen uh, theoretical basis for what the Uncanny Valley may be like. And they include things like mate selection, uh, Sorites paradoxes, violation of human norms, religious definition of human identity, threat to human identity. Um, what do you both think is maybe the top one or two possible reasons? Or, or, or is there maybe three or four causes? Well, what, what are your takes on that? Uh, I'm a narcissist. I would uh, pick mine to be the most important. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, probably it's not listed there. I, I think in general, people approach this uh, uncanny feeling uh, differently. So there's one school of thought uh, that focuses on um, some elicitors of this uncanny feeling. They focus on how the robot look that make it uncanny. But what Dr. Oshad and I, we think, uh, we want to focus more on the cognitive process that underpin uh, this feeling. 
So instead of saying um, this perceptual mismatch caused the uncanny feeling, we want to say this perceptual mismatch, how does it cause the uncanny feeling? So I think the main selection, as you mentioned, um, is an interesting uh, hypothesis. But the problem is if we relate a uh, robot as a potential mate or a uh, mating rival, then we first have to perceive it as a human. Mm -hmm. But none of these, uh, like uh, threat related hypothesis or mating uh, related hypothesis, really address this uh, untested hypothesis. So, what we want to propose is that uh, people first perceive a robot as a person, they anthropomorphize them. Yeah. And then, because we can discriminate a uh, human face from a doll face, we can perceive this animacy that we dehumanize this anthropomorphized robot. And that's what we call dehumanization process that elicits this uncanny thing. That, that's what we think yeah. might be uh, important for understanding this uncanny feeling. Although, uh, the uncanny uh, this dehumanization hypothesis is compatible with a lot of hypotheses you mentioned or listed on Wikipedia. Uh, I think it's just a matter of on which level do we try to explain this phenomenon because it's uh, very complicated. So, uh, in, in, in other words, uh, what I said before, I tried to express before, the, the first inc inclination we have uh, as a propensity, and we have evolved that, presumably, is to anthropomorphize. And, and we, we see faces everywhere. We, we detect faces. We, are, we have this automaticity to detect what is face-like, for, for example. Or, uh, and and uh, then, uh, so we load the face with, with animacy, and then we, 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 we subtract uh, animacy based on the experience and interaction we exchange with this space. So, I mean, that would be the idea. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a dual process. So first, uh, that's the way I would express it. I don't know if you can show that really with this description of loading the face. That, you know, when I sit in my tub and I look at the marble, the stones that surrounds me, uh, and I, I daydream, I see faces everywhere. I, I can yeah. imagine a lot of things going on. And uh, but that are all face, uh, there's an attractor to see faces and in and, and, and person. And then based on your experience, you, you can, and you try to distinguish whether uh, this face is for real or not. And you try to try to perceive a person into the surface characteristic of the face. Well, yeah, and that I, I was just looking up uh, the paradoxia that that where we see hum we we see what we want to see we we want to see familiar faces if if we see what looks like to be two eyes off in the darkness we think it's a predator we uh, if we see you know some rocks on Mars we think there's a face on Mars we, that that's wired into us um, uh, but um, I wanted to uh, ask a, a question about. The merging of human and uh, uh, robotics. Uh, you know, we have this idea of cyborgs, where you know uh, we we saw that South African runner who's now in jail for killing his girlfriend. I forget his name, but you know he had those blades and he could run yeah. faster yeah. than any. And so, do you think that things like cybernetic uh, and cyborgs, people who are part human, part machine, is going to be something that? Eases this, or do you think that's going to exacerbate perhaps the uncanny valley feeling? I, for me, it's very difficult to uh, to to speculate uh, uh, on that. There, there are things I would like to mention that you don't need to have like uh, uh, the Blade Runner, you know, who has this uh, this mechanical attribute that were added to his body to. Uh, create the maybe this uh, uncanny feeling, but I'm thinking of a movie that I really like. Uh, her, you know, this guy who fell in love with a, a, a CPU. I mean, uh, this voice, right? Mm. And, uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie, no, but, but, but I, what I find, uh, I find very interesting is that they have a very intense love affair, and it's all in the voice, something that is created by this computer. Mm. Uh, 
and and it's very intense and, and extremely romantic and, and thrilling. And uh, but everything falls apart when the guy realizes that uh, actually the CPU has 660 other relationships of that kind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the fact that it it uh, transgress this the the humanity of uh, of possession of uh, of another individual. I think that's where things break completely, and the, the guy could not respond to the voice in the same way because mm. it, there, there was a basic trans transgression of that. So I think, in, in terms of the dead brother, I mean, what is uncanny is not because he had blade instead of le legs, but it's because he killed his girlfriend, yeah. and it was uncanny for this guy who was a superhero, plenty of, of promise and, and success, to to be so low and violent. I think that's what the uncanny is. So it's a very human tragedy. It has nothing to do with uh, hybrid or something. Well, um, it's interesting you mentioned this film because probably the most famous science fiction film is 2001 A Space Odyssey. And in that, the computer is voiced by an actor who uses yeah. a very monotone voice, but it's definitely human. You know it's a human voice. It doesn't have that clang, tingy, tinny sound that we associate with computers. And, and the, the the reason that computer gets away with murdering things and and, and what uh, murdering the, the other uh, human uh, uh, actors or uh, characters uh, is because he has this soothing, reassuring voice. Which, looking back, uh, you know, fifty years since that movie came out, that's an interesting part of of why that character was able to do the things that it was able to do against the human protagonist. It was because if that if Hal the computer had a more less human sounding voice, it would have probably set off the alarm bells of the character as oh this something's not right. But to be human is to fall prey to seduction, and, yeah. and you know the premise is that what is seduction? Yeah. And that, that's the real because in this guy I forgot the name of the actor. She has an incredibly sexy voice in the movie Her. Yeah. It's exactly the antithesis of the synthetic voice. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that's what makes the movie so uh, appealing because you you really feel for this voice, and and you know that it's it's, it's artificial. I mean the source is that, but we are essentially and that's, I think that uh, uh, speaks to our intuition with Chen Chong about the uncanny valley and the uh, the anthropomorphism is that we are suckers. I mean we we. We first are sucked into assuming a lot of things, and then we debunk things. And when it becomes a little bit uh, uh, ambiguous, is that we cut in between, uh, you know, our beliefs and the realization that it's not between this maybe this kind of point uh, that, that might be linked to the uncanny valley. So you see, it's not far from the category uh, uncertainty, uh, but the. I think what it adds is something that is more emotional and more natural, at least that's the way I see it, that it talks to, to human psychology to anthropomorphize things. I mean, we yeah. have this propensity to project into our pet all kind of individual and, and characteristic. And that's a natural propensity. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the uncanny valley is probably linked to, to this propensity and the realization or the ambiguity that might be linked to this, but the, the mother of the engine is this propensity. Well, so, let, let me just uh, start wrapping things up here and uh, ask both of you uh, uh, the question of, uh, if we're going down 20, 30 years to the, the middle of the century here, uh, presumably, whether we get real artificial intelligence or not, I'm not as worried about it as many other people are, because I think that eventually humans and and AI will somehow merge, and, and that'll bring up a lot of problems, probably be great for lawyers uh, and lawsuits. But uh, um, do you think, do you see this as something that uh, we're inevitably going to get out of? Uh, that, uh, I mean, robots and, and artificial intelligence seem to be, at this point, we're speaking in 2018, inevitable. Um, uh, I guess I'll just leave it at that, both, both of you. Do, is it inevitable that we uh, w will probably get past this, uh, culturally speaking? Not that it's a great problem now, but, uh, I mean, it could p potentially become one. 
let, let me, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I've been invited a few times by uh, roboticians to come to the cultural the meeting because they're interested in self-consciousness and, you know, what is the self. And, and so uh, they were interested to, for me, to present my work with the infant, uh, the immersion of self, self-awareness. And, uh, but it, w- when I'm in Japan with uh, roboticists, I really personally uh, have a real hard time uh, to understand this uh, drive to, to create uh, as human-like as possible these machines. Okay? Uh, I think Alexa, for example, you know, the little yeah. robot that I have in my kitchen, I was very skeptical about, about that. I mean, Alexa has a voice. You know it's a machine. It, it, it's very interesting because it, it doesn't have to look like a woman. It can sound like a woman, you know. Uh, it, it simply has something that I, I, can, I can hear. It's more pleasant to have some a human-like woman voice in my kitchen. And a feminine the, voice is less threatening than a male voice, it's, if yeah, that was Alex. Yeah, but, okay, but, but that, that, that is fine. I mean, this is pl- more pleasant as a music to my ears, yeah. right? But I don't need to have something that is looks like like me. I never quite understood the need to have a, a create, creature-like uh, robot. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I never understood personally that. So my response to that is if, if people are, are a bit like me in majority, uh, I don't think that it's going to be an issue. Uh, I think that uh, the the robot will be very abstract and virtual and will not have to embody any kind of concrete representation. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you yes. have any comments, Shen Sheng? Uh, I, I think uh, I totally agree. I will not have a human-like servant <laughs> to um, bake a bread or give me a cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, yeah. um, I, I think robots are the creating of androids it's one of the human endeavor to create these human-like uh, human replicas, uh-huh. and that's been um, um, going on for thousands of years. We created puppets yeah. in literature, we created Frankenstein, and uh, we just like to create human-like beings. Well, let me um, just ask you, Shen Shen, because you, you've admitted now that you have that dis-ease uh, around them. And I'm wondering, just to get back to what I was asking about race and androgyny, do you recognize that that's a flaw in, in your perceptive abilities that, that if, let's say, this was 50 years from now and AIs are a, an everyday thing, you would be a bigot then? Uh... We don't know what's going to happen yeah. in 50 years. Yeah. Hope uh, the engineers can create more human-like robots, mm-hmm. uh, primarily because we're psychologists and we want to use them as test sets to yeah. study vision. It's like uh, uh, vision scientists use uh, visual illusion to study our visual perce- uh, visual perception. Uh-huh. We're like we're interested in using like human-like uh, robots. To study how we perceive animacy, mm-hmm. how we interact mm-hmm. with human beings. So I, I don't know the answer. What's going to happen? <laughs> but but before. but since you brought up the dehumanization, do you think that your awareness of this process would prevent you? Let's say if there was a human-like android participating in this conversation, sitting between you and Philippe, do you think that you would have the say intellectual facility to to say okay? I know that I'm a little bit nervous here, but you know, you, in, in other words, when we talk, think about people with their prejudices, whether it's racial or ethnic or religious or whatnot, most of them in some way seem unaware that they're wrong in how they feel. You at least seem to understand that you have this bias and it's probably not a good thing. So that puts you a little bit ahead of, you know, a uh, 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 Ku Klux Klansman, say. Uh... If you know what I'm trying to get at, you seem to know that that this unease is, is something that's maybe not the best thing to have. In other words, not not really. I'm no? not sure what you're. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, I think uh, in terms of, I, I think you brought up the point 
that uh, knowing that we tend to dehumanize yeah. uh, can somewhat uh, influence our perception of uh, human-like robots. I think that's a very interesting point, and there are individual differences in our sensitivity to those robots. Whether some people might feel um, um, a doll to be uh, good, whereas others might find them to be creepy. Mm -hmm. And there's been studies that show that lonely people tend to perceive more uh, animacy from those dolls. And, they and there have been a number of horror films made about mannequins and, and ventriloquists. And there are people that keep uh, yeah. doll babies, yeah. like pets. Yeah. So they they just take care of their doll babies, like take care of real babies. I think there are individual differences. So your individual disposition to anthropomorphize or to treat uh, artificial intelligence differently might affect your perception. But to what extent, for a general person, I I might find Androids to be pretty, mm -hmm. but if I try to control my feeling towards the robot, how that can have an impact on my uncanny feeling, that I'm not sure. Well, let me just wrap up by asking both of you then, uh, and I'll start with you, Shen Sheng, and then end with Philippe. Uh, uh, you mentioned the dehumanization. What is your goal going forward, ten or twenty years, to to be studying? Or, or you know, uh, uh, do you find it think that you're still going to be interested in both of those topics in ten or twenty years? Or you know, wh what is your ultimate goal then uh, in, in a career looking forward? I think uh, the uncanny valley hypothesis open up this opportunity to study uh, humanness, perception of humanness. And in this particular case, uh, the perception of human is in phases. So in my dissertation, I've been working on uh, the perception of human face animacy. Uh, and we want to see, when we say we perceive animacy, what does it mean? So do we associate animacy with certain human characteristics? Mm. And we also want to see uh, where does this animacy perception come from? So with Dr. Rochelle, we have been studying babies, how babies perceive face animacy, and at what age do they start to perceive animate and inanimate face differently. Mm -hmm. And we also want to study individual differences in the perception of animacy. And we want to link that to a more broader issue of dehumanization and humanist perception in the social psychology literature. And I, I want to ask uh, uh, Philippe about his uh, his future. But before I do, you brought up a point that I just wanted to touch on. It's interesting. Uh, when I was uh, 18 years old, my dad died from cancer. And he died. He was thin. He looked like he'd come from Auschwitz. The cancer had ravaged his body from a hale hardy man to being a living skeleton. And then when, he, when they made him up for the funeral home, they put so much makeup on him, he looked like almost a wax mummy. And I remember looking and saying, that's my dad? And I, I had that uncanny feeling because even as he was dying and, and, and in, he was still human and animate, but once he was dead and they drained him of his blood and put on the makeup and made him look like he was a wax figure, there was something creepy about looking at him. And I'm, you know, I'm just wondering if, if that's part of the reason we have this unease about death because people don't come back from life and a corpse is like a, an animate human being. Uh, I, I, that just came to me. I, do you have a comment on that, Philippe? And, uh, I have a, yeah, I have a, I had a very similar experience like a few months ago. My mother died at 97, and I arrived five minutes after she passed, and uh -huh. she was on the bed, and uh, they had dressed her. I mean, you know, uh, she looked, frankly, beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, for 97, she looked very beautiful. And uh, she was... Uh, Deeply asleep, but yet not asleep. Yeah. And uh, I, I had this total reconciliation with uh, the the understanding that uh, of how we uh, depict the, the 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 transformation as where the soul leaves the body with little wings. Yeah. I could. I, I had the feeling is that suddenly she became an object. Right. Okay. And and it was sudden, it was unmistakable, and and she was there. And there was this ambiguity 
And I think that, you know, one of the reasons that uh, we've been interested in, I personally have been interested in the academy, that is the, the perception of animacy, what can cause the, uh, 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 the perception of animacy. And I'm a developmental psychologist. I think that this kind of very complex issues can be best understood if you look at each infant and child in their development. Yeah. So we are very much interested in the development from uh, the perception of surface characteristics, the yeah. fact that newborn, when you present them a face uh, with two eyes, one nose and one mouth, they will going to be attracted toward this canonical configuration compared to uh, eyes, nose and mouth that are scrambled on the face, they will track much more mm -hmm. and be more interested. If you look at how they look at the uh, they scan a face, they will spend a lot of time on the external features and by two months they will look more and more into the internal feature of the face in the context of uh, social interaction. And what I'm particularly interested in and will continue to study is the emergence of the detection of a person uh, in, the, in, the, in the early in the early development. Mm -hmm. And it's in this context, the uncanny value phenomenon is an interesting uh, crack to understand uh, the issue of agency perception and yeah. what it means for us. You know? Yeah, it's interesting because I've actually seen a few people die, been there at the moment of their death. And if you look at their eyes, it's, it's eerie because in one sense, nothing has changed but everything seems to change. And is that a real change or am I projecting my own thing into it, you know? That's a, and that's a basic philosophy question yeah. about the subjectivity. Yeah. And apparently uh, we lose 21 rounds, but uh, that's another story. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I want to thank you both for spending an hour talking about it, Shen Sheng Wang and Philippe Rochard. I'll link to both of your pages at Emory University. Anyone who sees this video, can feel free to contact you. It's a fascinating subject, but so I'm thankful that you spent an hour speaking with me. So uh, good luck to both of you in the future. Okay. Thank you.